everyone, welcome to Journeys and Journals. I'm Bernie Martin Beck, and I get to talk to fascinating people. This time, you can turn the clock way, way back, because my guest is not the previous century, but the previous one to that. You want to know about the Rogue River and the tale that goes from all across the river that starts in Douglas County, and he He's got stories into California, but let's meet. You are? Stan Olds. Stan, but tonight you're... T I'm Hathaway Jones. You really dressed up for the part. Good evening to you. Good evening. You, uh, y what's this Hathaway Jones story? I mean, I hear it. Uh, who was he? Who are you? Let's okay. just put it in that context. Hathaway Jones was a contracted mail carrier on the Rogue River back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He followed in the path of his father and his grandfather, who were both mail carriers also, and tellers of tall tales, especially tales about the area of the Rogue River. And, and that's where this book, Tall Tales of the Rogue River, comes in. Yes. It's a little bit of history and a little bit of blarney, can it's I say? Exaggeration, <laughs> more than blarney, yes. Oh, but here's this cabin. Now this comes right out of that book, Tall Tales from the Rogue River. Now that could cabin could be any place, right? Oh, any place, along the river, up in the hills, yes. Yes, that's the way things were back, back when. How did you get involved in Hathaway Jones' life story? Well, I found that book sitting around the house. And At began, your house? Yes. Belonged to relatives, and I started reading it and got so enthralled in it to all the f exaggerations and ex things of, of the people on the river and uh, started sharing them then with uh, kids at the elementary school over in Gold Hill and they just ate it up. Because they're kind of yarns, they would you are. say? Mm -hmm. So now, what, Gold Hill, that's home for you. Yes, now. And uh, you share as a paid employee at the school? No, you I just volunteered. I said, do you think the kids in the fifth grade would like to hear some tall tales? And the teacher just gobbled it up, and the kids really went crazy for it. One of the girls made a pop-up illustration of three of the stories after she heard them and they look forward to me coming every week you do it like start a school year every week mm -hmm. you'll right be after there. lunch walk in there and uh, since the uh, illustrations are so small um, I asked the teacher if they had an opaque projector that I could uh, blow them up with and I found one in the stashed away in a storeroom and Kids were real helpful about getting it out for me every week, setting it up, pulling the screen down, and uh, uh, well, just I, really love the, the stories. I'm going to be one of those school kids here just for a few minutes and say, go ahead, tell me one of those stories. Well, I'll tell you the one I told at the Schmidt house in June about the boot pegs. It was a real hard year. The crops all failed, the potato bugs ate up all the potatoes, the uh, corn, the worms ate up. It was very dry then, and it didn't look like we were going to have much of a supply for winter. And we were way up there, there in the upper lower rogue, you know, and, and uh, I got an idea. Boot pegs were real popular, and this is kind of like one that I uh, whittled out. And you could either stick it in the wall or stick it in the crack on the floor, when you come in out of the fields and things, hang your boot on it to dry. And so I whittled them out and uh, I told the folks of the community, if we all work up until the first of November and get as many boot pegs whittled down, I'll take them down to San Francisco, sell them and bring back supplies for the winter and things for Christmas. And boy, they did they go to work. You know, we got Oh, over a hundred bags of boot pegs. Gunny sacks full yes. of boot pegs. And I had uh, big ones and right. little ones. And 
I had two Indian helpers and we packed up all of our mules and uh, they each carried 300 pounds apiece except the smaller mules, they only had to carry 100 pounds. But uh, we headed off down uh, the road and we got down there and we went across the Chetco. I told the folks, you know, I can make it across the Chetco and down into California with no problem. And you know, they, they knew I could because there was a point in time when I beat out the posse about, by about 10 minutes across that same route. Uh -huh. so we went on across over to uh, Wairica there and then on down to Sacramento, caught the steamboat into San Francisco, got to the feed, got to the uh, supply store there and you know, some darn fool had invented metal boot pegs. Oh no. So here we are stuck with all these boot pegs. What are we gonna do? Well, we took the mules out, unpacked them, let them graze and uh, one of the Indians that was with me looked at one mule that was nosing around one of those uh, bags and he says, him like a moats. Another idea come into my head. We worked feverishly overnight, whittling every one of those boot pegs down into little oat sized pieces, bagged those up, took them to the feed grain store, sold them all, got enough money to buy provisions for the rest of the winter and 300 pounds of candy. We made our trek back up, got home on December 24th, and the kids and the, and the community had the most wonderful Christmas ever. And that's what he take these yarns and, he, and you take these yarns. Where do you go with these silly stories about well, make-believe and there's campfire stories, aren't Anybody they? Anybody that'll listen. Anybody <laughs> that'll listen yes. to stories about the way it was back in gunny sacks and tent pigs. Right. These are, are pretty incredible. What, uh, what did this guy who wrote all this down, did he know him? Did he? He just studied all the documents and books and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, it's noted that uh, Hathaway Jones's collections of stories are the largest of that genre uh, in the United States. Oh my goodness, is this raccoons? Oh, you want to hear that story? Sure. That one I'll have to read. Oh, Hathaway Jones and the real, I'll put on my coonskin cap because I can see that's coming. You didn't know raccoons grew on trees, did you? Well, this is called the raccoon tree. There was a period of time between the World War and the Depression during which coonskins were at a premium. Hearing about the high prices, Hathaway Jones decided he would make some money. Coon sign was everywhere and he owned two dogs that would run anything from a chipmunk to a cougar. They were so smart they understood everything he said and it only required a few minutes to make them understand he wanted to run coons. The dogs seemed to think it would be fun chasing coons because just as soon as they grasped what he wanted, they laughed and frolicked around in a manner peculiar to dogs when they are pleased over something. Mm -hmm. They soon jumped a couple of coons, taking after them with a great hullabaloo and of barking and other sounds characteristic of hound dogs. Every few minutes they would start more coons which would join the other others until it grew into a regular coon exodus. All the coons ran in the same direction and before long there were so many they were like a herd of sheep, only very much faster. He being a good runner ex experienced no difficulty in keeping pace with the hounds. The coons ran much faster than could be expected of such fat chunky creatures. The chase continued for five miles and some of the old extra fat coons began tiring and lagging behind. They would have liked to climb a tree, but there was no time. It looked bad for those old ones because the dogs were catching up. And while coons can, can fight like demons, they cannot make much a good showing when exhausted from too much running. They were saved, however, from the dog fighting by a big old cedar snag which stood near the river in the middle of a small clear space. The snag was 15 feet in diameter. 
at the ground and 80 feet tall and hollow. There was a small opening at the bottom and of course the top where the tree had broken off was open. Coming into sight of the snag, Hathaway stopped and almost held his breath in amazement at what he saw. All the coons were running into the bottom of the snag. In their haste, they crowded like people when they are panicky or when they all want the same thing. And just as the old liver-colored lead hound was reaching out to snap him in his rear, the last coon darted into the snag. The dog tried to get in too, but the entrance hole was so small he could not squeeze through. Now Hathaway knew he had a great many coons in the snag, but how to get their skins was a problem. It would take too long to chop down the snag, not to mention the hard work involved in that operation. Furthermore, when the snag fell, the coons might all run out and escape, unless the fall should smash the snag, but in that event, the fur would probably be damaged. He thought of building a fire in the bottom of the snag and smoking them out, but a fire might burn up through the snag like a chimney and singe all the fur. Building fires in old snags was one of Hathaway's main sources of amusement, and he knew how fire, fire is apt to roar up through them. He considered chopping the entrance hole larger and climbing up into the snag, but he would need a ladder for that, uh, the, ho the holler uh, part being quite large. Even if he succeeded in climbing up inside the snag, the coons would escape him as climbing would require both hands, leaving him with nothing with which to catch them. It looked rather dark for Hathaway, but bright for the coons, when suddenly three big coons came running out of the woods with the hounds right behind them. They streaked for the snag and into the hole, but when they did so, a coon was pushed out from the top and was stunned by its fall to the ground. Hathaway finished it off, hitting it in the head with a manzanita club, then sat down upon an old snag and concentrated. After a few minutes had paused, here come the dogs with three more coons. When they crowded in the bottom of the snag, three other coons fell out the top. Dispatching those three, he carried them to his log seat, and there it dawned upon him that the snag was full of coons, so full that for every one that crowded into the bottom, one was pushed out of the top. Day after day and night after night, the hounds chased coons, while Hathaway knocked on the heads and skinned the overflow. When the dogs grew hungry, he fed them coon meat, and when he grew hungry, he broiled coon backstrap on the end of a stick. <clears throat> while the dogs were hunting coons, Hathaway slept, and while Hathaway skinned coons, the dogs slept. <laughs> At last, the dogs could find no more coons to round up, so they came and sat down with Hathaway, telling him by their expressions and actions they were all through. They had done well. The pile of skins had grown quite large, but the snag was full of coons and it seemed a shame not to get their skins. So Hathaway told the dogs to drive a big mean skunk. But they hesitated because there is nothing in the world a hound dog dislikes more than a skunk, except a porcupine. And it was only after he explained his reasons for wanting a skunk that they agreed and trotted away into the woods. They were hardly any time at, the, at all finding a big skunk they could drive. Eventually, the varmint knew about the old, evidently the varmint knew about the old snag because he made for it as hard as he could run, which was not very fast. However, the hounds pretended that they could not catch him, keeping just a few feet be behind, baying and yelping at a great rate. Gaining the hole in the bottom of the snag, the skunk decided to stop running and resort to chemical warfare. Oh, no. He released a blast of liquid gas, hoping to catch the dogs on their noses, but the draft drew all the smell up through the hollow snag. It was too much for the coons. They fairly streamed out of the top and rained down upon Hathaway and the dogs. Working furiously, he succeeded in killing them all, leaving the skunk in full possession of the snag. The dogs went to sleep while Hathaway skinned and skinned until finished with the last coon, he counted up and discovered that he had 7,581 prime skins. And all of these are tall tales. Yes. That's the name of the book. Yeah, you read about a 15-foot rattlesnake with a head the size of a pumpkin. Uh, and uh, fangs so long to go through a three-inch door. Oh, my goodness. Now, you said his dad was a storyteller? Yes. Oh, I, by the way, I just put on your coonskin <laughs> camp. It, it's uh, how I remember coonskin caps. They were quite oh, the yes. great. Yeah. Um, 
why Hathaway Jones? Why? I mean, tell me about the man himself. What was his connection? He, he had to work for a living, didn't he? He well, couldn't yes. just spin yarns. That's right. He was a contracted mail carrier, and he did it by mule pack uh, all along the Rogue River into the, into the remote areas where people didn't get mail any other ways. And this was long before boats went up the river to deliver mail, you know. Uh-huh, because we now know about the mail boat that goes mm -hmm. in. There's a story in there about the heavy snow where he was coming down and he was delayed because of the snow, and it's all you could see was his hat bobbing up and down above the snow as he was riding the mule from mailbox to mailbox and people waiting for the board's catalog. I'll bet that part's true. <laughs> Part of this is just, and, and he, you're saying that, well, a guy who's kind of lonely on those long, how long did it take him to go on these mail trips? I really have no idea on that, but he talks about uh, leaving in the spring of one year and uh, re you know returning the following summer. He liked to come down to Grants Pass and do shopping. There's a fantastic story about a nice watch he bought and left hanging on a tree when he sat down for a break and a lunch on his way back and forth. And then he found it the next year still ticking. 60 feet up into the tree, and so you knew how deep the snow was. Oh, <clears throat> okay, <laughs> okay. And all his stories kind of grow and grow. Yes, he will tell a different version sometimes of the same story, and depending on the audience and depending on his mood, yes, it'll change. Well, now, you brought this hat. Is that part of your props for these tall tales that you tell at the school? Yes, he is wearing a hat similar to that on the picture on the cover, just a floppy old hat. And I just happened to stop into Daniel Boone's out here on the highway one day looking for a hat, and here this thing was. And I thought, that I would probably make a good Hathaway Jones hat. Uh, it looks yeah. like a vintage hat. Well, it, 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 and you got a little bit of plumage there. Yes, which I he <laughs> Was he a he was a collector. He was a... Oh, probably. Uh, I, this is my addition, just because I find the feathers, the cats leave them around, or the birds leave them places, and if I see an interesting one, they'll just add to the hat. Well, now, what's this with the shirt? Well, this is the shirt for the YMCA. I've also done some reading with the kids. Same stories with the uh, Y Hall group after school. Well, now, this says 18 and 44. What do you... Well, that's when the YMC was established in London in 1844. And it was Young Men's Christian Association. And uh, it was established for a place for young men to go to study the Bible. Oh. Before anything else. And women were allowed in at the Y. <laughs> at the Y more recently, recently just yes. in my in my lifetime, Probably, yes. huh? We sure appreciate the why in, in mm -hmm. most communities. I know that in, in Europe they have the, like, lodging that's yes. run by the why. Yeah, that developed too then, and then the sports and things came much later. Probably here in the United States, I'm not sure on that detail. It's a safe place. Yes, it's a and wonderful place. <laughs> you know, and, and so you're involved in the why you're involved in school, and now you're involved in the Historic Society. Yes. Is it all about giving back to the community? That and doing what's enjoyable, fun, and learning. And folks, you can see that dimple there, and you <laughs> know he's having fun. He's having fun. Well, you know, it, this is the part of the, the country that Zane Gray writes about. Yes. Would their lives have connected any, do you suppose? I, being on the river, uh, dip, if, now see, Hathaway Jones died in 1937. Now, if Zane Gray was here well, before he was, that time. Well, he was writing books in the 1920s okay, and, so and others. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating, the stories. And this is full of cookbook. This is a cookbook about how to cook whatever. Probably that raccoon that you're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> Even in here, I didn't read it yet. But uh, the the whole idea that great stories come out of these parts, yeah. as they say. Uh, 
you got a silly one here. Maybe you could just spin the short yarn about I'll this one. I'll just kind of excerpt it. It's called the Smart Bear. Now this is, uh, I believe, uh, Ike Jones, who was the grandfather, uh, had a pin for wild hogs. And he had seven hogs in there. And he'd gone off for a while. And when he came back, one of the hogs was missing. There was a trail of blood. And all the corn that he had in the corn crib stored up was strewn along the pathway from the corn crib to the, to the, to the hog pen. And he watched one night, and here comes this bear out of the woods. And uh, he went up in the tree and finished off the carcass of a hog that was there. Well, Ike went and, and, and slaughtered one of his hogs and, and did it in the smokehouse. And when that bear came back the next night, he's obviously scratching his head and looking in there. And he went off in the woods and brought back <laughs> another hog to replace the missing one. And from then on, if either one of them had taken a hog out, that bear would replace it with another hog. Blarney, Blarney, just it, it, I'll lots tell you. of animals. Have stories about snakes, about uh, uh, birds uh, of all kinds. Uh, they cougars. There's a story in there about Samson, the father, being raised and and fed by a mother cougar at, when he was born. And his mother died at, at childbirth, and Ike didn't know what to do, so the cougar. Uh, insisted that he feed the baby on the cougar's milk. Well, you know, some of this could have its its roots down in truth, couldn't yes, it? Yes, it definitely. But you said the stories kept growing? Growing or changing or... Um, but, and you know, uh, he was very proud of his reputation as the world's greatest liar. Uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh. And I have one thing else here to share. I picked up, uh, there used to be a yearly Tall Tales Festival somewhere, yeah. but it's been brought to a stop as storytelling has taken on a new meaning with politicians being the primary keepers of Tall Tale tradition. Uh oh oh <laughs> <laughs> Now, storytelling, I'll tell you, uh, there's just some campfires that I bet you the people out there watching right now are remembering some tall tales, stories about how the animal, well, the fish grew longer and longer every year, the stories about the tall tales. Yes. Um, you've brought an interesting bit of history to us. Now, this man really lived. Yes right here in some place along Josephine the... Josephine County, Curry, from Curry County to uh, uh, Cave, uh, to Grants Pass. Long, a clear, uh, and, and he really was a mailman. Yes. And he, mm -hmm. you can find that documented oh, yes. in the history. Yes. Uh, you found his, well, I was going to say driver's license. I, no, I think that... This is from Pioneer Days in Ca Canyonville. And they had a whole thing about Hathaway Jones there, and there's some interesting things here. He uh, did the mail pack train from West Fork Station of the Railroad over the mountains to the miners on the Rogue River and into Eden Valley. Mule Creek is said to have been named after the nature of the animals in his pack train. Uh-huh. Now, that's Douglas County. Yep. And mm -hmm. so then you go clear down to Curry County mm -hmm. with his tall tails. Right. Well, you can imagine that... He had he, relatives in Canyonville also, apparently. Well, and that's because that's where you'd catch the train. Mm -hmm. You could catch it and get off... What station? West Fork? West Fork. Oh, I've heard of West Fork. That was as close as you could get to Down River. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, why about you? What brings you to today? What brings you to this um, enjoyment? Why do you like to give back, give to kids? Well, I taught school in California for seven years before I came up here in 1980. I did some substitute teaching, some school bus driving, lots of different things like that. But I didn't have a chance to spend a lot of time with my own three boys and their children as they came along. Uh, every time I had an opportunity, I would share these same stories and others with them. 
I think I gave them all my books at one point. Uh, so I'm starting a new collection. Ah. Uh, I enjoy the kids. The kids enjoy, you know, the attention and, and hearing things that they haven't heard before. And nothing is, nothing is electronic. You know, I play games for the kids at the Y too, but they're all table games. Some of them homemade. So I say no electronics here. Now, what's the reason for this? Well, it's just another thing I enjoyed doing. Uh, I asked them if there's any way I could, could do something there at the Y to, to add something new. And they get enough electronics in their world, and you're offering mm -hmm. a love of checkers? Checkers, dominoes, trominoes, snakes in the grass, which is a variation of uh, chutes and ladders that my dad made years and years ago when I was little. What's chutes and ladders? Well, chutes and ladders is where you, it's a table game with 100 squares and you roll the die and move the piece. Uh, if you hit a ladder, you go up. If you hit a chute, you go down. Well, we put a snake in place of the chute. So it's a ladder up and a, a snake down and you try to get to the top. And if you get to the top, you get a prize. And uh, I'd added something to it. I put a little Bible at the bottom of each ladder. And if they land on that, they read a Bible verse, then they go up the ladder. Oh my, you know, you've brought, you're taking something that's just nonsense and you're blending it in with uh, your joy of kids. Right. And then you're adding some good stuff. This is wonderful, folks. What are you giving back? You know, when you give back to kids, you're actually given forward. You're given to their kids and their kids, generations. Mm -hmm. You think that in this yarn, or almost any avenue, I mean, you could be teaching cooking classes. You could be teaching Zane Gray from his cookbook here. Mm -hmm. And those kids would be jumping at the funny stories in this mm -hmm. cookbook. But why not give back? Was it a goal of yours? No, just uh, an idea. Just Somebody gave to you when you were a kid. Of, well, I'm sure, yeah, my, my parents uh, especially, and teachers along the way showed an interest and helped me in various areas. Which vaulted, oh, we just ran out of time. How can that happen? <laughs> Too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm Bernie Martin Beck saying bye for now. <laughs>